it was a place where a person could become a gentleman in the best sense of the word. I don't know where I would be standing today, but it wouldn't be here if it weren't for Fishburne Military School. I think the, the city of Waynesboro would be an entirely different place if Fishburne wasn't here. Whether on the parade field, the classroom, or in the gym, everything at Fishburne Military School is done to create the Fishburne Man of Tomorrow. This tone of discipline, respect, hard work, and leadership has been carried on at Fishburne ever since the school's founding. Each cadet today is directly connected to a great and proud history born through traditions and a culture of excellence developed by generations of alumni, administrators, and instructors. The grand history of Fishburne Military School began humbly enough in post-Civil War Virginia as the vision of one man, James Abbott Fishburne. His mission of educating honorable young men and preparing them for lives of leadership remains as strong and relevant today as in 1879. James was born into a large family on April 10, 1850 in Waynesboro, Virginia. The son of Daniel and Margaret Fishburne, James would be the 11th of 14 children. He grew up in Waynesboro attending school and working to earn money to help pay for his future college education. In the fall of 1866, James enrolled at Washington College located in Lexington, Virginia. This college, known now as Washington and Lee University, was close to home, being only 45 miles southwest of Waynesboro. At the time, Washington College was in a renaissance, having recently named Civil War General Robert E. Lee as its new president. Four years later, James graduated from the school with high honors and had his diploma signed by General Lee himself. James Abbott Fishburne was a remarkable man in many ways. He came from a family long established in the Shenandoah Valley, and he came away from his education at Washington College determined to start a school of his own. After graduation, James taught at a variety of schools around the region for almost a decade, but always found his way back to Waynesboro, where he had larger ambitions for his hometown. In the summer of 1879, he transformed a room on the second story of Taylor's store into the beginnings of what is now Fishburne Military School. On September 15, 1879, James A. Fishburne officially began his school, Waynesboro High School, with 24 co-ed students. A year later, wanting more space and more students, the school would move to the old academy building at the corner of Wayne Avenue and Broad Street. And a year later, Fishburne chose to make the school male only, as an all-female school would open up close by. With many aspects of the school changing, so did its name, and in the fall of 1882, the school would change its name to Fishburne Home School, only to change it again the next school year to Fishburne School. James purchased land on Evans Hill to expand the school even more, and in 1883, the first barracks was built. Constructed of wood and standing two stories tall, this barracks would need to be expanded a number of times to accommodate the school's quickly growing number of enrollees. By 1884, the school went from an all-male school to an all-male military school. Assistant Isaac Holling Saunders would serve as the school's first drill master. Saunders, an 1884 graduate of the Virginia Military Institute, was eventually named as the first commandant of cadets in the fall of 1887. By 1884, the cadets were wearing a uniform and marching. By 1885, we had a commandant from VMI. The Corps was organized as a battalion. From that, really developed the school that we see on top of the hill today. By the fall of 1886, James A. Fishburne gave his school its still current name of Fishburne Military School. Attendance bloomed to 63 cadets, 49 of which were boarders, and 14 day students. At this point, the school grounds encompassed about five acres. Fishburne leased and then purchased the front parade field land, now Anderson Field, from John B. Taylor. The field would be beautified and prepared for future baseball and drilling grounds for the students. Trees were planted, and the campus was fenced in to unify all buildings and grounds. 1885 also marked the year FMS received its first military honor, being given the title of best drilled school in the district. The school's growth continued as a new gymnasium was built. The extended barracks was now 132 feet long and all buildings on campus would enjoy a new steam heating system. 
The next school year, FMS would form clubs for both baseball and football. The first 10 years were of rapid growth and change at FMS, but this growth would waver as the Panic of 1893 set in. This countrywide economic downturn led to six years of double-digit unemployment and would seriously hurt enrollment at FMS, forcing the school into reducing its tuition cost to $285, including both room and board, in order to attract new students. In 1897, FMS was first accredited by the newly formed Southern Association of Secondary Schools. FMS is proud that this distinction has always been retained as an unbroken annual honor, unique among all other Virginia schools. The Spanish-American War would be the first war in which Fishburne alumni would take part. Seventeen Fishburne alumni would fight in the war and only one, Richard B. Smith, would lose his life. During the 1903-04 school year, master builder M.R. Ellis oversaw the construction of a third story on the barracks, as well as the enlargement of both the kitchen and the dining room. 1904-05 was a booming year for the school. Cadet enrollment grew by almost 50% from the year before, and it marked the birth of Fishburne's first printed yearbook, TAPS. With photography still being done mostly by professionals, Instead of the photo-rich yearbooks of today, yearbooks would contain a variety of other unique prints including drawings, creative stories, and even favorite jokes of the year. With the exception of the Depression years of 1933 to 1936, TAPS has been published annually by Fishburne Military School. This year also saw the formation of the FMS Alumni Association. Twenty-nine charter members subscribed their names in the matriculation book. In 1913, after a lifetime of working to improve education, develop leaders, and create better citizens, James Abbott Fishburne would retire after 34 years as principal. He spent the next three years raising funds for the construction of a new brick fireproof barracks. He would name Major Morgan Hughes Hudgens as his successor. The academic year of 1916 was an exciting time in the school's history with local architect T.J. Collins and Sons from Stanton being hired to design the new barracks building, the three-story brick structure would take until 1922 to complete. Today, its Gothic Revival-style facade still stands and the barracks functions as both the classrooms and dorms for the cadets. At the time, it was able to accommodate the boarding of 100 cadets, and the center courtyard was given the name the Quadrangle due to its shape. Attached to the barracks is a wing containing a chapel, mess hall, and swimming pool. The front and part of the south and north sides were constructed first, just behind the original frame barracks in order to prevent the loss of a session of school. When this first portion of the brick structure was completed in 1917, the wood frame barracks was burned down. This left a spacious parapet in front of the main building. At the same time, the athletic field on Wayne Avenue was graded and leveled. The United States' entry into World War I came in April of 1917, after two and a half years of efforts by President Woodrow Wilson to keep the United States neutral. More than 250 faculty, staff, alumni, and cadets would serve in the war. Astonishingly, of these, none would perish. A greater awareness to news and events would also form as CQ School newspaper was founded during the 1917-18 school year. In February 1919, the U.S. Army JROTC unit was established. Major James F. Byram was the first in a long line of active duty officers to command the JROTC department at FMS. On Armistice Day, November 11, 1921, at the age of 71, James A. Fishburne would pass away. James and his wife had no children except the thousands of cadets they loved and guided as their own. His motto was, Dare to be right, and the 1922 TAPS stated, This school was the apple of Mr. Fishburne's eye, and one of his last conscious utterances was a prayer for my boys. In 1920, Captain Charles Ellison, a 1906 graduate of Fishburne Military School, resumed his teaching career at FMS after serving as the American Vice Counsel to England. Throughout the decades, scores of FMS graduates like Ellison would return to Waynesboro as teachers and administrators in order to give back to the school they had grown to love. Ellison, during his cadetship, authored the school song and the school yell. Numerous other cadets would make their own contributions to Fishburne's culture over the decades, such as the creator of the school's crest. 
Designed by Cadet James Wilbur Owen, Class of 1926, the shield would first appear on the cover of the 1925-1926 TAPS and still serves as the school's crest today. 1928, this year stands as one of FMS's strongest bragging dates. This was the first year the Fishburne Cadet Corps was rated an Honor Military School under the Reserve Officers Training Corps ROTC program of the U.S. Army. Fishburne has never failed to achieve this honor and is distinguished as the only junior ROTC school in the country with such a record. In this same year, the Corps of Cadets was honored to march in review for both President Calvin Coolidge and Virginia Governor Harry Flood Byrd. FMS had 212 cadets enrolled at this time. Due to the Great Depression, among other things, the school would not enjoy enrollment this high for another 15 years. On April 11, 1938, FMS Founders' widow, Mrs. Mary Amos Fishburne, died at age 86 and the school acquired her real estate, the present site of the administration building and the alumni memorial gymnasium. In the years since James's death, Miss Mamie, as Mrs. Fishburne was known, continued to occupy the Fishburne home and was known to all the cadets as a kind advisor, sitting in her chair, watching the events on campus and always ready to hear their news. On Monday, May 15, 1938, at 3.45 in the morning, the fire alarm was sounded as flames were sighted engulfing the gym. For more than eight hours, firefighters fought the blaze but could only contain the fire to protect the surrounding buildings. The origin of the fire was never determined. Just as the barracks was rebuilt with brick, so would the new gym and in the 1939-1940 school year, FMS would see the dedication of both the new gymnasium and the new administration building. The newly expanded administration building is unique in that it actually contains the late Fishburne's house within it, as it was never torn down, but instead incorporated into the new structure. This year, the FMS rifle team would also win its first two consecutive National Rifle Championship trophies and a VMI classmate of Colonel Hudgens, U.S. Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall would visit the school. World War II was underway in Europe, but even in the face of great trial, FMS would prosper with cadets enrolling at a steady rate. General Marshall delivered the commencement address that year and would later review the Corps. Led by Battalion Commander William Hume, Class of 1940, in keeping with a long line of Fishburne men, Hume would graduate from FMS and go on to serve as the 23-year-old executive officer for D Company in the 26th Infantry Regiment. During the invasion of Normandy, Hume's unit would be one of those tasked to take Omaha Beach, and while beachhead organizing the invasion's inland push, Hume and the battalion intelligence officer were killed by a barrage of enemy shells. When World War II ends in 1945, Fishburne would mourn the 41 of 800 active duty alumni who perished fighting overseas. And although FMS would be honored as one of only three schools east of the Mississippi to earn the U.S. Army JROTC Honor Unit rating during the 1948-1949 school year, trying times were soon to come. During the midst of the Korean War, Fishburne Military School was struggling and the school's fate looked grim when tax advisors made it clear to the owners that it could no longer survive as a private business. I believe it was of 1950, the family stockholder, the owners of the school, having been advised that it was hopeless for a proprietary school to try to exist the way Fishburne operated on a uh, for-profit basis, decided that the pr prudent thing to do would be to close the school. And they entered negotiations with the city of Waynesboro and came out into the public and announced in that October day that the city had bought the school property, that the school would close the following May and the city would take over the property and develop it for municipal purposes. And there was an enormous groundswell of opposition to that move among the townspeople, leaders of the town, and, and just people who depended on Fishburne economically. The school had support constantly in this community. It had support from the industries and the businesses in this community. 
it was a part and parcel of public service to this community. I certainly remember taking my young men and my watch down to fill sandbags when the South River flooded. We responded. It is a great school in a small town that is as much part of this town as any other piece or facet of it. In the fall of 1950, the owners privately negotiated a sale of the school to the city of Waynesboro for urban development purposes, and the school was set to close in May of 1951. Opposition to this was soon to follow as loyal supporters formed the Fishburn Hudgens Educational Foundation, which begins intensive fundraising and recruiting efforts to keep Fishburn's doors open. It was a difficult thing to raise enough money to buy the school. I think at the time it was well over half a million dollars was needed. And while they were able to obtain loans and mortgages, they also sold debentures. These debentures would earn interest only if that interest was earned. But these debentures were sold in $50 units. And remarkably, restaurants in town had the situation that every waitress bought a debenture. And of course, businessmen bought larger units. But it was amazing how it's a lot of people who, who'd never gone to Fishburne, never had people who went to Fishburne, realized how significant it was to the city and to the economy of Waynesboro and really to the whole flavor of life here. And they wanted to see that school continue. The, the school is a, a big part of the fabric of the community and um, contributes to the identity of the community, both in its physical presence and its location in the center of the city. And um, it has a significant economic presence in the community. Um, it's a terrific employer. The school tends to be woven into the fabric of civic life here. The cadets participate in um, community events. They support community events by lending their effort and assistance. Um, and I think just seeing the, the faculty and the cadets around the community is something that is part of most Waynesboroans' self-identity as members of the community. On March 11, 1951, the city sells the school to the foundation and FMS remains open. After 38 years of being superintendent and 51 years of overall service, Colonel Hudgens retires. In his honor, the elite FMS drill team was named Hudgens Rifles. Colonel John C. Moore would take over as superintendent and serve in that position for two years before longtime faculty member and headmaster Colonel Edward P. Childs would replace him on December 31, 1955. Childs had arrived at FMS in 1922, taught mathematics, science, and music through the years, and became headmaster in 1945 on his return from active duty during World War II. He was a consistent friend, a counselor, and was beloved by cadets throughout his tenure at Fishburn. As superintendent, he brought strong financial controls to Fishburn and built the Corps to over 200 cadets. In 1957, Fishburn would open its doors for summer school for the first time and by the 1961-1962 school year, FMS was filled to capacity with a waiting list for interested students. During the 1950s, once again, Fishburne men answered the call to arms. The war with Korea claimed the lives of six Fishburne men. In 1964, Colonel Edward B. Young, Jr., veteran faculty member and commandant, is hand-selected by Hudgens and Childs to succeed Colonel Childs as the fourth superintendent. Young would serve as superintendent until 1973, after which he remained legendary as head of the English department and active as a trustee of the Fishburne Hudgens Educational Foundation, which he had served from its beginning, and was also responsible for shaping the Alumni Association from a loose-knit group into an effective organization of 3,000 members dedicated to directly supporting the school. Up through the height of the Vietnam War, although public opinion was quickly souring on all things military, Fishburne's enrollment had been growing strong. The 1967-68 school year had the largest corps in FMS history, with 233 enrolled. This era brought a lot of changes off campus as well. With the events at Kent State and the shocking Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations in 1968, 
Social and political unrest were growing in the late 1960s, and voices throughout the media were fueling American desires for peace, stability, and equality. One such advocate, Eugene Payne, FMS class of 1938, would win the Pulitzer for editorial cartooning in 1968 while working for the Charlotte Observer. Despite the national turmoil, all seemed strong at Fishburne as Colonel Phil Brooks retired at the age of 75, following 50 years of service to the school. It was said at his funeral in 1989 that Fishburne was his life. Brooks, who had given up a potential career in Major League Baseball in order to pursue a life teaching, mentoring, and coaching young men. He was a key player in helping FMS navigate the treacherous financial straits which followed the school's near closure in 1950. By the end of the 1972-73 school year, the effects of the Vietnam War were finally taking its toll. Enrollment quickly slipped as Colonel Frank A. Stone was named the school's fifth superintendent in 1973 upon the retirement of Colonel Young. Young would remain in the FMS community as an active and vital member of the Board of Trustees. While Stone was a career Army officer and educator with extensive experience in ROTC programs, universities and high schools, his experience would not be enough to combat the tide of public sentiment which had soured against all things military and enrollment plummeted. From the high just four years earlier, FMS was now 100 enrollees lighter and stayed that way for three more years. The Vietnam War, of course, was probably the most unpopular war we ever had, certainly t up to that time. It was extremely unpopular among the general citizenry and it made uh, military training in general unpopular with the youth of America. All of a sudden, inquiries at Fishburne seemed to stop as almost as if a faucet had been turned off. The tradition of a cadet wearing his uniform when he went home on leave had to be abandoned because you, we couldn't risk sending a cadet out in uniform on public transportation. The downtimes would continue as the war went on to claim 15 FMS alumni lives, and in 1974, Colonel Hudgens died and Colonel Stone resigned. Not surprisingly, in the fall of 1975, Fishburne opens with its lowest numbers since 1932, enrolling only 96 students. Once again, Fishburne Military School was facing a dire situation. Enrollment and public sentiment were at all-time lows. It looked as though the school might finally fall beneath the weight of all these dark circumstances. The Board of Trustees, rather than filling the vacancy left by Stone's resignation, opted to appoint three men to share the tremendous burden of riding the ship. Robert Miller, Stanley Harris, and Robert Kirby. Miller was well liked by the cadets and their families and had earned a reputation for impartiality, fairness, and genuine concern for the well-being of students. Harris was also known for his fairness, but was widely respected for his stability and professionalism. Kirby, class of 56, was held in high esteem for being a savvy and creative businessman who could wrestle the school's finances into line. During this period, FMS worked hard to reassert its identity and carve out a path for future successes. Focus on campus turned to traditions, both old and new. Ceremonies such as first formation and the blessing of the colors were added to the school calendar. Cadets and alumni embraced this deepening of the Fishburn culture. It was this esprit de corps, particularly among the FMS alumni, that perhaps did the most to keep FMS together through these trying times. Other military schools throughout the country were not so fortunate. A bittersweet moment occurs for FMS when Stanton Military Academy closes its doors and 51 of its former cadets enrolled. This same year, Fishburne, continuing to look for ways to expand and strengthen its programs, would welcome the National Honor Society as part of its extracurricular core. By the end of the decade, Fishburne Military School's enrollment was rebounding and the school was nearly full by the time FMS officially celebrates its 100th anniversary in 1979. A centennial taps is printed. Sports begin to take off again as well as Fishburne winning VIC championships in both basketball and baseball. FMS would win other sports championships, but the Quezons built a dynasty in track and field which would span the next 15 years. 
Starting in 1980, FMS won the VIC Track Championships for five years straight and took eight out of ten in the decade afterward. Although FMS was enjoying a resurgence, the national landscape for military schools in general remained a bleak one. In 1984, Augusta Military Academy closed its doors, and due to Fishburne's near full enrollment, only one cadet was accepted from the defunct AMA's corps. As enrollment and finances at Fishburne stabilized, there was a return to normalcy in terms of school administration. The position of superintendent was reinstated in 1986, as headmaster Colonel Robert C. Miller is officially named the sixth superintendent. This would prove to be a banner year in school history as growth returns. The school is given new modernized tennis courts and the swimming pool reopens after renovations. Gerald Belisles, Fishburne class of 1959 and a member of Fishburne's Board of Trustees since 1977, is elected as Governor of Virginia in 1986. This would propel the school into the national spotlight. The Corps of Cadets would march in the Belisles inaugural parade. The Governor would make a number of high-profile visits to the campus and would pass along the Sword of Honor to the 1988 Battalion Commander during that year's first formation ceremony. During the same time period, three long-serving and influential members of the school's modern faculty would join Fishburne. Robert Wees, William Cedar, and Susan Johnson are hired. Wees had taught government at Stanton Military Academy since 1956. Cedar, a graduate of VMI, had taught at Augusta Military Academy and Randolph-Macon Academy. Johnson brought a different perspective to the faculty, having previously taught in public schools in New York and Virginia. Two more big gifts were given to Fishburne, one in the physical form, the Carnegie Library, located just past the southern edge of the school grounds, and one in prestigious form, as FMS is named both a Virginia Historical Landmark and National Historical Landmark. Yet another bittersweet moment came as the Frederick Military Academy closed and donated their cannon to FMS. This cannon is still fired today at field parades and football games. After 40 years, the Fishburne Hudgens Educational Foundation retired the debentures sold in 1951 and ownership of Fishburne passes to a self-perpetuating board of trustees who oversee the long-term investments of FMS and otherwise set the general policies and long-term goals of the school. To see Fishburne survive and flourish has, has been really the challenge that, that kept me eager to do my part on the Board of Trustees. And I've worked with many outstanding older people and younger people in the course of those nearly five decades. And, and I've really seen this school take off. In 1991, another long-standing member of the faculty passed away, Lieutenant Colonel Denzel Winden known as Chief to All on Campus, spent 39 years teaching, coaching, and mentoring Fishburne cadets. As the Fishburne family mourned the loss of Chief, many were moved to think about the school's future once again. The Colonel Young Brigade was established in 1994. This group, made up of senior donors and long-term supporters of FMS, was formed to bring organization and urgency to the fundraising efforts on campus. Today, the Colonel Young Brigade is, along with annual fund, referred to as the lifeblood of Fishburne Military School. Soon after, the Hardy Legacy Club, named in honor of John Thomas Hardy, another of the school's saviors in the 1951 crisis, is formed to encourage planned gifts to the school. Hardy, who graduated from FMS in 1927, spent 44 years as an active FMS trustee providing financial, spiritual, and practical guidance to the school. On campus, FMS continues its focus on tradition and heritage, and in 1995, the school's uniform was switched back to the traditional gray blouse and coatee worn by the Virginia Military Institute and West Point. In 1996, more adjacent real estate was acquired with the duplex apartments and the house on Maple Street. During this period, internet access is added to the barracks. Major General James M. Lyle becomes the seventh superintendent in 1996, but stays in the position for less than a year, and Colonel Oscar Bo Beasley, FMS Class of 1965, takes the reins. The first alumnus to serve as head of school, Beasley was an Air Force veteran praised for his vision, integrity, and determination to strengthen FMS. He would serve until 2001. 
In 1999, ground is broken for the first new building to be constructed on the hill since 1940. The building is made possible by a gift from John Thomas Hobby. Hobby graduated from Fishburne as a four-year cadet in 1932. Returning home, he joined the family business, becoming a leader in the Raleigh area. In 1988, he became a trustee of the Fishburne Hudgens Educational Foundation, Inc., and in 1998, in recognition of his mentor, Colonel Hudgens, he donated funding for the construction of this building, Hobby Hudgens Hall. You ask me Fishburne's secret of success, it's the combination of people that have come together on that little hilltop up there and through history have stayed together. Fishburne, without its alumni annual giving, would close. Those alumni, the hundreds of them that donate, the members of the Colonel Young Brigade, the Senior Giving Club, those who give from five to twenty-five to ten thousand dollars are still all part of that family, and they're treated as part of that family. That's how that school, that little school, survives: is the constant effort since literally its inception, and the constant dedication of a small number of men and women to its future and its success. The new century is greeted on campus with the official opening and dedication of Hobby Hudgens Hall in the spring of 2000. Alumni would be more up to date on FMS as well with the CQ newsletter being resurrected for the first time in two decades. In April 2001, General Eric Shinseki becomes the second serving U.S. Army Chief of Staff to visit Fishburne Military School, landing in his helicopter on the parade field and inspecting the Corps. Later this year, Beasley would retire. For the next three years, management of the school was handled by now headmaster Colonel William Cedar, who reported to an operating committee comprised of senior Board of Trustees members. The search for a new superintendent would last for three years. In 2004, Colonel William Alexander, FMS Class of 1965, Fishburne's Director of Development and Fundraising is tapped to becoming the ninth superintendent and the 2000s quickly become a decade of infrastructure improvements and alumni outreach. By now, parts of the school are beginning to truly show their age. The stoops and boiler are replaced. The barracks is rewired for high-speed internet. Fire alarms and suppression systems are upgraded. Sad news would come in 2006 as former superintendent Colonel Young would die. Young devoted his life to the Fishburne cause, and as a testament to his influence, on August 28, 2006, a House Joint Resolution is passed by the Virginia General Assembly celebrating the life of Colonel Edward Brickford Young, Jr., in which it is resolved that the General Assembly mourn the passing of an exemplary educator and an outstanding Virginian. The front field would also get a makeover during this period, and in 2007, Anderson Field was dedicated in honor of former Quezon's football standout Dusty Anderson, Class of 65. Dusty's longtime friend and FMS Class of 64 teammate Vince McMahon, founder and CEO of WWE, was on hand to enjoy the moment with him. The school's curb appeal improves when the sentry box is rebuilt, thanks to a gift from the Class of 1941, at the Federal Street entrance. A decorative wall with new signage and lighting is constructed around the sentry box, and the project is unveiled during that year's alumni weekend celebrations. The FMS Alumni Affairs Office begins promoting and planning alumni socials throughout the country. The events, intended to promote and solidify bonds between alumni, are a tremendous success. The 20-year-old alumni publication, The Quadrangle, is transformed into a glossy magazine which highlights the achievements of alumni and promotes alumni events through in-depth articles, interviews, and photography. At the conclusion of the 2006-2007 year, Alexander retires as superintendent but continues to serve the school as a fundraising and management consultant. He is appointed to the Board of Trustees in 2015 along with his long-serving sixth predecessor, Colonel Miller, who returned to Waynesboro after retirement. As the foundation takes up the search for the next superintendent, Susan Johnson, now assistant superintendent, English instructor, and cadet advocate, is appointed as interim head of the school. She is the first woman in the nation to ever lead a military school. Colonel Rick Zinser is hired as the school superintendent in the fall of 2008. Zinser transforms the somewhat less formal summer session into a full-blown military session and introduces JROTC classes and training into the summer curriculum. 
Summer school enrollment flourished, with 101 students enrolling in 2009 for the five-week program focusing on academia, sports, and leadership training. During his tenure, Zinser works to further upgrade the use of educational technology and soon every FMS classroom is equipped with smart boards, thanks to generous alumni support. By 2010, every cadet's room has cable television and wireless internet access. This focus on technology was regulated by the school, helped enrollment rates with over 200 students enrolled by the spring semester. And I would certainly say that the best time I've ever seen for Fishburne are these years right now. I've never known the cadets to be as well-rounded. I've never known the educational program, the curriculum, to be as thorough. Certainly the equipment is better. The athletic program is more far-reaching. It's more inclusive. Everybody is involved, everybody is challenged. A cadet is forced to learn time management, to learn good discipline, and to learn values that are not always being taught in society as a whole. And of course, seeing that this is the best time I've ever seen, I like to think that there are even better times ahead for Fishburne. At the conclusion of the 2010-2011 year, Zinser steps down as superintendent and on October 1, 2012, FMS alumnus Gary Morrison is named as the school's 11th superintendent, bringing in new ideas for educational reform. A 1981 graduate from the school, Morrison also served previously as a science instructor and director of admissions at FMS. Sports continued to thrive at Fishburn and with a newly renovated swimming pool located below the mess hall, the swim team would gain new members and the school is able to hold meets thanks to a generous donation. Football head coach Dan Baranek, who would be promoted to headmaster the next year, would lead the 2014 team to its stunning undefeated season for the first time in exactly 100 years. In 2013, of the 318 JROTC units that comprised the 4th Brigade, FMS would be only one of three qualified to send both their Raiders and drill teams to best of the best. Increased numbers of students seeking U.S. Service Academy nominations begin to apply to FMS. The class of 2015, made up of just 38 seniors, boasted six Academy nominations. Two significant buildings on campus were also repurposed and rededicated during this period of new growth. The Carnegie Library, located on 11th Street, directly behind the barracks, was reopened in 2013 as the Fishburn Military School JROTC Leadership Center. The Alumni House, also on 11th Street, was dedicated and put into use that same year. First acquired in 1926 to serve as the school's infirmary, the Alumni House now provides office and workspace for the Alumni Affairs Department and the Communications Department. In 2013, Fishburn launched a STEM initiative. This focus on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics has had a tremendous impact upon the curriculum. One of the new programs offered to the students is VASTS, Virginia Aerospace Science and Technology Scholars, where students are immersed in NASA-related projects such as rocket construction and launches. Faculty, staff, alumni, and families rallied to this concept, and soon the school's labs boasted new 3D printers, centrifuges, hydroponic equipment, and more. In August of 2013, Fishburne Military School was honored with a visit by U.S. Senator Tim Kaine, Democrat, Virginia. Kaine, who was touring the Shenandoah Valley and speaking about the state of Virginia's education system, toured the school and watched a repelling and one-rope bridge demonstration by the Fishburne Raiders. A few months later, John Marsh, former congressman, secretary of the Army and National Security Advisor, would deliver the Veterans Day address at Fishburne Military School. His address to the Corps of Cadets, which included his own grandson, and assembled guests included that, we should never forget what Mr. Fishburne did to establish this institute. We will never be able to measure the greatness of the contribution of those who have worn this uniform, marched on these grounds, went into civilian or military life, and went on to positions of greatness. From a rented room above Taylor's store to cadets using 3D printers to create rocket parts, 
Fishburne Military School has continued to grow in size, expand its curriculum, and attract quality students decade after decade. Thanks to the vision of its founder and the dedication of thousands of faculty, staff, alumni, and supporters throughout its history, Fishburne Military School has weathered economic and political storms which closed the doors of many contemporaries. Although the uniforms and haircuts have changed with the ages, it's clear that Professor Fishburne's dream continues to remain strong as in his words, it is my purpose to have here an institution which shall rank as first class in everything that constitutes true worth and from which shall go forth loyal, earnest, industrious boys and young men, well equipped for the duties and responsibilities of life and above all else, to maintain a high standard of honor and integrity in the Corps of Cadets. Now more than 130 years later, that early vision continues to thrive and grow as boys from around the world come to Waynesboro, Virginia to discover a passion for learning, a commitment to excellence, and an opportunity to become a Fishburne man. I believe if Professor Fishburne walked up that hill today, he would be very proud of what's happened. For all those reasons we've talked about, for all those hundreds of people who've supported that school, from all of its alumni, from its dedicated staff and faculty, from citizens here in Waynesboro and support from the community, I think he'd be very pleased. I think he would be very pleased at the quality of the young man and the fact that Fishburne is still doing what he set out to do in 1879, and that's educate and mature exceptional young men for leadership positions in the future of this country. Now I think Professor Fishburne would have a ball. I think that with that question, the future of Fishburne is well secured and it makes me very proud, of course. And I think that Professor Fishburne would just be astounded at the opportunities the cadets have today, the equipment they have, the knowledge that is available to them, the opportunities they have really to go forward, and the scholarship availability in military and non-military colleges that, that come to a well-rounded cadet with a good solid record. I believe he'd be very proud. I know he'd be pleased that the school had survived, but I think he'd feel that it had done much more than survived. And I think he'd say that he might well have taken it in exactly the direction it has come had he been given the time to live these 137 years.